Okay, well, let's get started. I'm Dr. Narda Robinson, and I am the founder and CEO of CuraCore Vet and CuraCore Med. Today, we're going to be talking about fascia, what's been missing from most of the rehabilitation programs that I've seen, and just the general approach within veterinary medicine. It's a crucial type of tissue that's everywhere. It's hard to find somewhere that there's no fascia. And yet, um, you know, when we diagnose an animal, oftentimes whatever maybe courses you've taken, they may recommend, you know, it's acupuncture, palpating along the bladder channel or just channels. But really, as we've been emphasizing here at CureCore for a long time, you have to heal all the tissues. And remember, neck pain is not just neck pain here, it's all the way around. So we're going to reinforce the reason why we have to consider the fascia all the time and address it specifically and generally. So yeah, for a couple of years now, we've been offering integrative rehabilitation, and that's part of what is driving this renewed enthusiasm from my perspective about fascia. I mean, being an osteopathic physician for, you know, since the 80s and working with this my whole professional life, I've known about it and I've attended to it. And of course, in the acupuncture courses and medical massage, we we teach about it. But with integrative rehabilitation, I mean, rehabilitation has been around in the veterinary profession for what, 10, at least 10, 15 years, maybe longer. And yet it is so musculoskeletally oriented and post-surgically oriented that we felt here at CuraCore that we needed to disrupt the system and really expand it to be not post-surgical in orientation, but um, not even necessarily surgical, just what is going on with this individual? Who are they? And as you know, we'll be recapitulating through the talk today, you know, why do they, why do they walk like this? Or why do they walk like this? Or, you know, have, have a head turn or, or whatever it is. And because we're conditioned to funnel our patients into various baskets of diagnoses, it's like you get what, let's be generous and say maybe a hundred different diagnoses that you learn about in veterinary school. Okay, fine. So if you haven't heard about it, you don't think about it. And if you're not thinking about the different tissues in here, then if we say, why is this dog lame in the forelimb? You know, it's like, well, you have just these categories to choose from. Kind of like in human medicine where you have to make a diagnosis and then get reimbursed if you take insurance and all that. So you have to fit them in. But but that's not the best type of medicine. And so with veterinary medicine, just we have to expand our differentialist. We have to even consider differentials and then um, expand what we think is involved. And even if there was a problem with the bone or a tod band or something, we have to think whole body, whole patient, inside and out, top to bottom, front to back. Okay, so that's what we will be doing here today. So there's several several questions about rehab that I have, as I've been saying, why focus on one joint or limb when everything matters? Why consider rehabilitation post-surgical when it's really either post-injury or just really supportive of what that animal needs on day-to-day activities of daily living? Why push protocols when the diagnosis for each animal is unique? And I know that a lot of people like protocols. What's your protocol for cruciate? What's your protocol like with acupuncture for urinary incontinence? And that just makes me mad because even though we want to give you some guidelines, and even with the rehab course, it's like, here's some guidelines in general, but you shouldn't be just resting on that. You shouldn't be um, thinking that that's all you need to to use. And then you can go on. It's like people that say, what's the CBD dose that I need? I don't want to hear about all the mechanisms, interactions. It's just, it's just not the right way to go forward. So the first thing and the bulk of everything is diagnosing. And that means palpating. That means inquiring with the verbally uh, speaking animal in the room and and watching them move, watching interactions, the whole thing. And then 
maybe we will come up with a diagnosis that looks like maybe that was the one that that animal was referred for, but maybe it could be five things going on. It usually is not just one thing. And any protocols that even we might teach in a course uh, are only just airline templates. And then you would understand the reason why you would implement a certain modality and when and how often based on what your particular findings are for that animal, which is why you really can't do medicine based on having five minutes to diagnose an animal. Um, and then why spend the bulk of time on modalities if you haven't even identified the, the problem? So uh, from a just a teaching perspective, it's great to learn magnet therapy and shockwave if you want to, or you know, therapeutic ultrasound and all the exercise things, but that is only a way to address what the problem or problems are once you've identified them. And really, if you're focusing on doing things, you might not have so much focused on figuring out why. So that's what we want you to do is be a good doctor and focus on why. And, um, you know, some of the people when they first come to our acupuncture course, even they don't, it's like they've never even heard of what a differential diagnosis is. So there's a lot of stuff to correct in veterinary medical school. And then having come out of an orthopedics type of rotation and, and standard education, it's like, well, what do you see here? I see muscles and I see bones. So if this animal doesn't walk right, then it must be because of a muscle or a bone or maybe a ligament, uh, if you're lucky, or maybe a tendon. And rarely does any kind of innervation, any kind of compressive neuropathy, any kind of, you know, usually not even trigger point pathology, myofascial issues, but there can be so many things and it's so much more fun to treat animals from this multidisciplinary aspect. And so everyone differs in their fascial flexibility. We'll be talking about fascia and what it is and where it is and why and all that. But even you, where you are, you could figure out to some degree your fascial flexibility. And recently when I, I've been this year to a couple now of human uh, fascial dissection courses and somewhat with veterinary medicine, but in human medicine, I think it's more common that you'd have an Ehrler-Danlos syndrome, which, um, which I guess the diagnosis standardly you've probably already done this in your life, you see, can you touch your thumb to your forearm? And I, I'm pretty flexible. I mean, I'm not there. I could practice this and get it there. I don't have allergic download syndrome where your skin is just sort of like, it's not really a sharp pay, but you get the idea. And there's just enzymes there in the tissues that won't allow for so much healing. So if they get injured, they sort of stay more injured with, with a, lack of robust repair versus as the instructor for these courses, he's got some kind of Nordic background. And he says, you know, as a Viking, it's like, I'm really stiff, but I heal really well. And so if, if you can't go too far down or, or bend your fingers back too much, you know, then you might be of that more stiff type. And why that matters clinically is that whether you're a human or a non-human, how I'm going to treat you and rehab you or address your needs from a physical medicine perspective is going to differ based on your particular type of tissues that you have, which means we watch, we feel, and, and we understand, is this individual hypermobile? And maybe you've had injuries, maybe you have disc disease, maybe there are hypermobile segments there because of perhaps aging or injury. And so there's been ligamentous breakdown, ligamentous laxity, which has produced or prompted some calcium deposition there and some bony remodeling, aka arthritis. But that might be that one area that is weakened, partly because of just some neuromuscular reflexes going on and, and hypermobile versus this area could be too tense. And so what we do, again, from a physical medicine perspective, and from an exercise therapeutic perspective is going to depend on what that tissue is doing, where it is, and why that's happening there. And that's why you can't just go blindly into protocols. It's not one size fits all.
Um, and so when we talk about fascia, it becomes real interesting real fast, especially when we apply it to fruits. But uh, fascia, you see a whole bunch of fascia here, and we can use the sliced orange as a metaphor. You know, some people, well, when you're talking about emotional stuff, you think of an on onion with the layers and mm, cry and everything. But um, with fascia, one of the perspective changing things is thinking of the fascia, the outer fascia as a unitard. So as we, um, the, so we have the skin and then there's the sub epidermal kind of sub even dermal area, it's your subcutaneous area. And there's some super fascia, superficial fascia in there. And then there's the fat in that layer as well. But that is continuous. So it's as this, the, as if this dog, I mean, he's he's wearing a unitard, I mean, of material, but he might as well be wearing a unitard of fascia because that's that's what we're enveloped in. So just like the orange here, this outer rind is the fascia that is encompassing. So this is the orange's unitard. But you see, so here's where some people can go wrong. It's like, okay, I know fascia, it's connective tissue. It comes in aponeuroses. It can also be tendinous and um, restrictive and we get more collagen breakdown and all this stuff. And then you forget about it. And it's like, yeah, okay, well, so when we massage, we might stretch it a little. That's That's a very narrow understanding of fascia. So just anatomically, as we look at this orange, we can see the outer rind or unitard, but we see how the fascia of the orange is creating sections. So, you know, there's where the juice is, which is collected in all these little bundles. Each of those has fascia or connective tissue, if you know, metaphorically from the fruit perspective, around each of these. So the reason that we can identify individuality in all of these little collections of juiciness is because there is separation so that gives us that gives us one of the perspectives on fascia so fascia connects so that's the idea of the unitard everything is connected within this fruit i mean and it's sliced but it was that's just to show you the differences it's all a whole thing there is no separation here. Um, everything is adjoined and then things are invested. So fascia connects and it separates. It just matters where it is and what's going on to, to characterize just that structural beingness of what that thing is. And, and there's a reason and a rationale for things. And when we think of plants in general, I mean, how does water get from the roots into the blossom and then creates this orange? How does that travel? What's the central area about? I mean, I hate this thing. I don't like eating that at all. But that's probably where the, all the nutrients and stuff go to fill each of these sections. And then we know also from a essential oils terpenes perspective that most of the limonene that is in the orange is right here in the rind. And so that's why with lemons, I mean, you get that zest because you get that essential oil. So the individual here is created with things collected into areas that with the structure function relationships, I mean, there's a rationale and innate wisdom in nature that has borne fruit here. Um, and we see if we, if we really delved into this, it's like, well, why is this here? Why is this here? you know, why are these separated like this? And so like that with the body, we can think about cross sections and we can think about how things are collected and that there's a an innate wisdom and a structural functional relationship that is inextricably intertwined. And so here with this depiction and these um, pictures in this webinar from Shutterstock, but this is the body's unitard and you can see sort of distributed here from the artist, like lines of force and just organization. But that is that is how we are all put together and we are collected and acted upon from various mechanical forces. If we go deep to that, and we're kind of looking at muscles here, 
But we also see if we can forget our prior indoctrination and think, oh, deltoid here and pex and rectus abdominis. If we take a step back, as we should if we're studying fascia, then do you not see on the arm, I mean, this continuity, there's a functional connectivity here that makes sense of these extensors of the, of the arm and the forearm and the fingers versus the flexors. So we begin to see a categorization, a visual kind of separation. Even though we see the unity, we see that there is, there is compartmentalization in terms of what structures are doing what and then how if we if we start even from the midline of the chest that we go in a continuous fashion to the fingers and this is this is what the acupuncturists of old were getting at when they created the acupuncture channels was that for example when we have the stomach line that that's coming down here with the sternocleidomastoid down the rectus abdominis and then down the the limb here down to the toe. And you can kind of see that there is, if you'd have to go deep to the pectorals here, but there is continuity with the line by and large, especially when we get to the bladder line, uh, we can see that as well. Now, then when we have the organs, those aren't just, there's not little hangers for the organs inside the body. They are suspended. They are suspended by fascia. They are collected within fascial structures and fascial little blankets. And, and they are, you know, the whole tissue is packed with fluid. And that's what makes the fascia and the muscles and everything that's contained in there come alive and gives you this turgor. And, um, and then when, you know, when you study fascia, like with Tom Myers, who talks a lot about tensegrity, that we have, for example, this is a tensegrity model of the pelvis. So it's not exact anatomically, but it shows here that we have, well, these were the limbs in a bipedal individual, and this is more the pelvis up here, that every time we have a change, you know, it's all connected. So tensegrity is, is like those bridges, suspension bridges, where you have areas of compression uh, suspended within this integrated structure that, that is under tension. And so even if you said, okay, I'm going to think about cruciate because who doesn't? Well, there's much more to think about than cruciate. And if you're going to change weight bearing, it's like everything is affected. And so as we look at this true system that is interconnected and all affected, then it's going to be that it's not only for the, the somatic structure, but it's also going to affect how our organs move. So if we had an individual that was, you know, really shortened and bunched up and everything, what's that going to do not only to the back, but also to the organs and also to the, to the ability to have good respiratory excursion and diaphragmatic movement. So it all becomes important. And that's the basis of integrative rehabilitation, at least how we're teaching it at CuraCore, is it's, it's in no way, <laughs> you know, a coronoid process or the cruciate ligament or, you know, medial shoulder instability, which is to me a, a really weak diagnosis. And it, you know, what all is affected? And if you don't treat it all, you're not going to fix it. You're not going to prevent further problems. And so the real mind shift comes, and, and this is, again, due to uh, Tom Myers and the courses I've taken and the stuff I've watched of his work and everything, he wrote Anatomy Trains and re kind of described myofascial, he calls meridians or, or anatomy trains where it's all, all connected. But he has, he has lines that differ somewhat from acupuncture lines. But um, from that type of thinking, if you shift your focus from, from being really focused on the uh, skeleton as moving, so just as you're in your body now, what do you feel? Do you, are you, a tent, maybe you have some neck pain or back pain, but I think that we have been enculturated to consider that we are a skeleton that is moving and we drag our soft tissues with us. So with that idea, how does a skeleton move? A skeleton doesn't move. It's like, like with chiropractic, which we'll be covering in future webinars and no oh, bones out of place, which is, it's just, has needs explanation. Um, 
but bones just don't get stuck in ways, right? It's the myofascia that changes things. It's the nerves that keep on firing. And so if we shift our thinking from the orthopedic surgery, orthopedist impression of if you can't see it on a radiograph, it might not exist. If we take away the bones and just see them maybe as just a structure, a framework, and realize that in truth, it's the soft tissues that are moving. See, my my finger bones are not moving themselves. What's what's moving? What is what is giving me this kinesthetic sense? It's the nerves. What's moving is the muscles. The muscles are being triggered by my brain, right? So motor output, but I, I'm still getting sensory motor feedback. What's going on here? And so the purpose of this picture being here is that just to think about our skeletal system as being suspended within the the tensegrity or the connective tissue, you know, the these properties that are hydraulic in nature and and you know give form and give shape and also contain quite a bit of metabolic activity. So just think about that for a bit um, when when you're waiting for a bus or something and and think about how how much you've been oriented to consider where my bones are in space be instead of oh what's happening with my tissues then you have control you can figure out okay where's my posture i it's like that's the truth and where's your posture how are you sitting and then your bones can can go along for the ride but it's time to give the soft tissues their rightful position in the centrality of form and function. And then the idea that everything is connected and unitard in nature for the outer part and then invested like that orange, we can think about the development of the cell and individual. So being a fertilized ovum, that's where we all began, right? And, um, and you know, so what happens? Well, you get you are a one cell individual and you've got everything is is connected and you're kind of floating um, and then you're two cell and then you start to have these membranes and division but nothing is separated once you have separation then and once you also have a lack of communication so when we think of apoptosis which i've mentioned in previous webinars but the programmed cell death as cells become fatigued or stressed or have their DNA modified or something, when, when it seems like they're, they've gone rogue, then the mitochondria, just the, our whole innate system has ways that it's either going to kill the cell off. It, I mean, if, if it can't repair it, it's going to kill the cell off. And that means sort of poking holes in the membrane, making it more permeable, and it just ultimately goes away. But the body has reason to attend to a lack of signaling from an area. And, um, and that's why being interconnected and in communication is so important. So just the drive home thing here is that we were once very simple. And as we became more complex and during development, as organs migrated, as slips of muscle tissue joined, maybe a nerve came through it and as an aberrancy, you know, and then we had apoptosis in the human or else we would have webbed fingers and toes. So we had some cellular dieback, but this was all programmed. It's all biological. And, um, and yet we're all still one unit. So um, that's that. Now, when can things become distorted? Well, obesity is certainly a problem in humans and non-humans. And it's nice to think about, okay, what would I look like if I lost all that space in there? But it is consequential for humans and non-humans in terms of force generation, relationships to gravity, weight bearing. But also when you think about the toll that the, the distension with, with fat and all that stuff of the tissue has, so the toll it takes on, on positions of, of muscles, on the amount of, of the counter forces you need to stay upright, also the amount of fat inside the body and all that. And then you could also see just even in this artist representation, but these lines of force. So this is this is where fascia, there's a lot of fascial strain here. 
where these folds are. And so this is just so hard on the body for a number of reasons, but you're really pulling uh, and reshaping the fascia, which is what? So from this, this was a, a nice journal article in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, just a consensus view about fascia and its role in, in sports and athletic performance and how, how things need to expand to address fascial injury. So as they say in, this, in the abstract, the fascial system builds a three-dimensional continuum of soft collagen-containing, loose and dense fibrous connective tissue that permeates the body and enables all body systems to operate in an integrated manner. So think of the orange and how you know all that orange and juiciness and formation. I mean that they didn't leave sections behind, right? When you cut an orange, it's not like oh that's a little embryonic piece. It all has to mature and develop together, and that's where we are. Now, one thing also I learned with the dissection class is when you're um, when you're removing tissue and and in that sense, I mean, we're artificially dividing things, but it's not like in medical school or veterinary school where you try to get away that fascia and throw it in the trash. But you follow, if you're going to isolate and mobilize structures that form a line of continuity according to movement and and um, and linkages, functional linkages, then what the body shows you is that where you have loose connective tissue. So so you just take the scalpel a little bit and it's almost like brushing it apart because it's just very loose and spider webby that you can mobilize that and and you get a whole structure there that is connected because the loose connective tissue is designed for mobility. And we can we can cut that apart easily or and watch it or just as as our body is in a place. There is there are reasons to have movement in in certain structures and there's reason to have you know more solidity again harkening back to fascia can separate or it can adjoin and so the fact that fascia is so ubiquitous means it's going to take a lot of different shapes because the body can use different formats in different areas so we already saw the adipose tissue which oh by the way is also hormonally active and and so there's issues there from an inflammatory perspective aponeuroses are those flat sheets of fascia like the thoracolumbar fascia or on our occipito uh, frontalis muscle, the epicranial aponeurosis. And then we have that deep fascia, the deep fascia, which is investing in the muscles and the superficial fascia is more where all that fat is and, and what we can move. Dermis under the skin, the septa, just like in the pieces of the orange, those are septa, uh, periosteia, so the coverings to the bone, all this is fascia. Uh, joint capsules, which are important when we talk about cruciate issues and pelvic limb lameness, all that in our rehab course, joint capsules, ligaments, and tendons, which also, according to people that are um, have been interested in re-envisioning how we consider anatomy, you look at a lot of these things, and from a functional perspective, they are just continuations of fascia, and artificially, in the anatomy books have been separated out, carved out. So you think that it's a separate thing when, when you open the body, you see that it is continuous. So, um, and retinacula as well, just the impact of all this and it's not separateness is that when we are doing any kind of rehab, when we're, when we're performing physical medicine, when we're doing massage, when we are practicing acupuncture, when we have laser therapy, when we have movement, we're not going really ever to affect one little piece of the body. And that's what I've said before. Our interventions have impacts, centimeters wide, body wide, maybe at the other end of the body, certainly at the other end of the muscle. And so it permeates through. And that's that's actually a beautiful thing because it means that we can target larger regions, which are also probably involved. Anyways, membranes, retinacula, and so on are part of fascia. Now, when we look at this diagram of, of skeletal muscle, and we think it's just an artist rendition again, when we think about muscle, and I have somewhere a picture of a 
pig leg um, anatomically. I mean, just interpretations. Um, but or your your steak that you're having for lunch or whatever it is, you you see the muscles in there and maybe there's a covering around things, maybe there isn't. But when you take it piece by piece down to the actin and myosin, there's fascia around the whole muscle, that's the deep fascia, but then there's even deeper fascia, which is enveloping around the muscle fibers and then each little muscle fiber. So it's going in, 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 and even ultimately into the cell and the cytoskeleton of the cell. Then we think about the blood vessels. Well, what are the blood vessels made of? There's, there's the endothelium, there's the tunica, so intima, tunica media, and then the tunica adventitia. Lots of connective tissue there. So we've got connective tissue, connective tissue, connective tissue. And then the nerves that aren't shown here, bunch of connective tissue there, more, more connective tissue than there is neural tissue because neural tissue is like custard and that would fall apart. So to have structure for the nerves, it's a lot of connective tissue fascial kind of stuff and so on. So again, to continue what the fascia includes, the meninges, so the covering of the brain, the pia, arachnoid matter, uh, dura mater, and and um, the epineurium, perineurium. So just like with the muscles, all the little pieces of nerves that then are bundled into bigger parts of nerves, all that fascial system. So we're not just talking about fascial tissue, but we're talking about as the system, as the everything in that orange that was interdigitating and cutting things apart and joining it as a whole. Fascia invests everything. And so as a system, it, it has a capacity to integrate our whole bodies. And again, that's why it's staring us right in the face. Why are we ignoring it in terms of, or not we, but why is it being ignored in terms of medicine in general and rehabilitation in specific? Because as it becomes unhealthy, then it's not going to work well and our animals won't move well, they won't recover well and all that. So intramuscular, intermuscular connective tissues, as we've just talked about, and visceral fasciae as well. So here we have the anatomy of a nerve, as I said, coming out here, coming out of the spinal cord, and just like muscles, repeating ideas, spinal nerve and you know, covered with this epineurium, and then each little bundle there, because remember there's gonna be sensory and motor components, there's the perineurium, and then even within that nerve fiber, there is fascia. And then of course we have blood vessels that have a bunch of fascia and all that. And so when we are working with an animal, when they are moving, they're not just moving their muscles and bones, they are moving everything and everything is responsive to stress and movement. And even as we know with Helene Langevin's work, as we talked about in the acupuncture course, that as we have stretch or when we have an acupuncture needle in tissue, and we kind of collect that myofascial fabric, even if we're going to do that dirty, a little bit of spinning or some stretching, whatever we're doing, then those fibroblasts that are in that connective tissue, in that extracellular matrix, they, they go from more of a spindle shape to flattened out. And that's the structure function change, where as their architecture changes, their metabolic, you know, aliveness changes. So they're going to flatten out because their tissue is being stretched. And that's going to reinvigorate. They're like, whoa, I'm going to produce all those things that I need to do. Um, all the growth hormones and the just reparative things. We'll go over that shortly. But they're going to kick into gear to be restorative and healing. So when we're doing our work, we are creating all kinds of changes. And let's see. So Deanna, Deanna has a comment. I just want to see if I can... Let me see. So, but okay, this isn't a question, but a comment. I'm going to move it over. I have changed my palpation assessment and treatment approach since watching the videos from Tom Myers on our ortho rehab course. So Deanna is one of our instructors. It was wonderful. And so we work on the courses together. And she said, I have learned that I need to pay as much attention to the strain patterns as I do to the clinical symptoms. Uh, the reason being is I have found strain patterns before the dog this is key. Thank you, Deanna. Before the dog becomes clinical and maybe then won't become clinical, so important. And that gives me a chance to intervene earlier. Key, yes. Oh, well, but 
you're stopping somebody from making thousands of dollars if you're stopping the TPLO. Oh, anyway, um, give me a chance to intervene earlier. God's going to get me for that one and limit the expression of clinical symptoms. Yay. This is an entirely new way of thinking for me and I'm still figuring it out. We, we're, we're all, we're all doing, it. we, we were, we were brainwashed in a, in a very minimalistic way. I mean, at least speaking from better MS and I, having had the osteopathic training I did, I knew going in that there was more to the story. And that's, that's why I'm so excited about doing the integrative rehab course with you, Deanna, and, and for everybody is, is like, you, you've been shortchanged. I, maybe part of the reason is that you have so many species to learn about. So as, as I said in school, a mile wide and an inch deep uh, versus human medicine. I mean, you're getting a whole bunch more stuff, but even human medicine, I mean, osteopathic is better than allopathic, I would say, being an osteopath, but also there's so much more to the story and research is finding so much more. And this is the age of fascia because there are fascial congresses. I mean, it's just, it is the thing. And sometimes it's it's misunderstood, so we have to really stick with science. But anatomy anatomy is so good because no matter what's going on in the world, anatomy is there and it's thrilling. And so it allows us to just come back to nature and to ourselves and to ways to heal people or animals. And that's what a lot of us feel what we're here for. So um, for those of you that tend to get tension headaches, for example, here is a cross section of not a real person, but I put it here to emphasize some of the fascial um, interrelationships between tissues. And this is an exciting area because I tend to get headaches here, uh, which is right suboccipital, which is at the foramen magnum. And so from, from the osteopathic training, we know that the dura mater, so the covering, that tough mother, um, covering to the brain attaches to the bones right here at the foramen magnum and also at S2. I'm pretty sure that holds for animals as well. And although uh, John Appledger, who teaches craniosacral to kind of anybody that, well, I'll, I'll stop there. But so John Appledger, who has taught craniosacral therapy, he's a DO, but uh, there's a big story there. Anyway, uh, but, but with microscopic investigations found that the dura here covering the brain interdigitates with some of the membranes right here under the occiput, which, which is thrilling as an osteopathic physician because it gives you that connection between the nervous system and the myofascial aspects of things. And it makes sense like when you're stressed and, and just things are going on intracranially, that there are tugs there, and I'll also feel it at S2. I'll just feel my nervous system um, just shortened, kind of, and and that's a big area to treat. But it it represents when we're talking about fascia and the continuity. That's where stuff going on in the nervous system, structurally and in the myofascia, they can affect each other. And so it's a big area of treatment. But you know, you wouldn't want to stick a needle right in there and penetrate the medulla. So we don't do that. But um, Anyway, just fascia, fascia, fascia. Uh, here is the kidney represented, it's not real kidney, but um, with the adrenal gland on top, sitting there, just enjoying the ride. But like the orange, can you see the similarity, you know, here as the sections of the orange would be and, and that there's a middle area and that there is a covering externally, there is a capsule. So there's, there's that fibrous capsule, which is fascia, which is containing that kidney. And then we have other types of connective tissue that are both separating, but also connecting. So we don't want the kidney to be leaking all over the place. We want to have a kidney there, but it all needs to be adjoined and all, you know, there's so much flow going through there and important blood vessel things and um, hormonal operations that are taking place that the fascia is containing and, and overseeing and interacting with. Um, other aspects of the fascial system, we're not done yet. I mean, we've talked about the vessels, also even the endocardium, so the endothelium. And, and so you see here, just sort of on the side, um, that we have different layers of blood vessels. And when we have something like atherosclerosis, which I felt for the first time in my life in these dissection, human dissections of unfixed cadavers, um, it's scary. It's, it's like gravel, continuous gravel in in arteries. Our guy had had 
a couple of open heart surgeries and you just had extensive atherosclerosis. I, I, it, it, it sh you shudder a little bit. It's so sharp. I mean, it could almost cut you just, it's, it's hardening of the arteries. It's, it's sharpening of the arteries too, just that, that calcium matrix deposition. So anyway, so there is fascia in health and disease and how do we treat our body and, and what ultimately happens. So by being everywhere, the fascial system enables the body and all its components to operate it in an integrated fashion, which we're about. And then I mentioned fascia versus the fascial system. Fascia is what we can dissect in terms of the connective tissue, but the fascial system is everything that is working as a whole. And then our perspective, again, can be micro level where we're entertaining the notion of molecular and cellular responses to the macro level mechanical properties and how like fascia can distribute forces. So we'll go into that a bit, but what affects fascia um, exercise. So, you know, in a rehab program, we're going to think how can we improve this individual's tonus and flexibility and what needs to happen where it's not going to be one size fits all. As I said, um, aging will cause changes and how many of our animal patients are geriatric and we love them dearly, but they need something a little bit different. And how can we support the physiology of their tissues in certain ways that we might not do for you know, a one-year-old? And then inflammation, where's it coming from? What's the neurogenic piece? What's the overweight piece and all that? Um, so this is what I referred to earlier. So when we talk about force distribution moving on, just the, the old idea is that, okay, we have muscles and then we have a bone. And if you had muscles, if you had force and you're walking, then you know, the muscle myotendinous junction will distribute force to the bone and cause movement. But it ignores all this complexity here where the fascia is enveloping each muscle and then could be transmitting forces between muscles, even to, to the bone along the length of the shaft. So fascia is not inert like styrofoam peanuts would be and just packing material. Uh, so from back so we have the idea of the molecular, cellular kind of concept of fascia and then mechanical properties. Looking again at the molecular, um, this extracellular matrix, so all that schmoo between the cells, between the individual structures that we think about, and all these adjacent cells, so like extracellular matrix against a muscle cell. When you look at that under electron micrograph, you can see quite a bit of interacting there, and it happens in a bidirectional, complex, and dynamic fashion. And so changes that happen to the matrix can change the structure and function of tissues and organs because they're encompassing it. Uh, what is the extracellular matrix? So if we even look at it from a tissue perspective and have the epithelial cell out here, then below that from the basement membrane, including the interstitial matrix and the cells in there, that, that is all from, from basement membrane to basement membrane, that's that extracellular matrix. And here's an endothelium, here's a you know capillary or whatever. We also know that there is fascia in that too. We just covered that. Um, this is, is more of a Shutterstock. The other was a Wikipedia image. This from Shutterstock it has more complexity, but it has the phospholipid bilayer of a cell and its cytoplasm there. And then it's next to the extracellular environment. And you can even see these integrin proteins and fibronectin. You can see how in the extracellular environment here in the light blue area um, has all these structures in it that are speaking and talking to those cells, uh, you know, cell that's sitting there next to it because it's contained within it. It's like it's mommy. And then we also have these cytoskeleton filaments. Like I said, with the fibroblasts, as you, as you stretch them out, you know, their cytoskeletal structure and architecture is going to change, and that's going to initiate changes in what they're producing as a fibroblast cell and all, all the goodies it uh, produces, um, hyaluronic acid and so on. So this extracellular matrix, which has been for so long ignored, actually is so biologically active, so not like styrofoam peanuts at all, but it's store, catch, and release biologically active molecules coming and going can regulate the activity, growth, and repair of tissues and organs. And, um, and so importantly for a physical medicine practitioner, when you have mechanical stress on systems like this, that it can encourage the release of biologically active molecules that were stored in there and affect activities such as vascular growth and blood vessel health. So 
expanding this idea. So then thinking of that micro environment in the context of the macro environment and the forces that are being transmitted through the whole system and, you know, into the bone through uh, those attachments. The old thinking is that, as I said, it, it's like, okay, I'm, I'm moving something here or I'm pulling something here and it's just going to transmit through muscles because I don't know of anything else that might be in there. When actually there are both intramuscular and extramuscular fascial tissues that are spreading those forces out, which is a good thing because then it puts less strain on the tendons, which are just continuity of, of my of fascia. And so then, but the ability of that force to be transmitted and be distributed so it's not overly impacting anything depends on the mechanical properties of the fascial tissue and how stiff it is, which gets back to what we're doing with photomedicine, with acupuncture, with massage, manual therapy, with uh, you know our modalities and, and ultrasound and, and movement and all that. So taking another look back at the fascia and, and a muscle that we have here, the individual fibers and, and even down here. So the, even everything's a collection of more tissues and wrappings and all that. And then I think they're depicting here the, the uh, satellite cell but just your know, sarcoplasmic reticulum. I mean, everything, it's, it's so highly organized and structured, but fascia is always in there. Think of the fascia here. Think of the continuity from the human muscle, that human lower leg, um, the nerves, and, and, you know, there would be a wrapping above and beyond this. And, but when we look at just even force transduction and, and when we're even walking, and so we're we're having forces come up from the bottom here, that with the gastroc coming into the knee, but it's just so beautiful. It's all continuous and beautiful and and interrelated. And even here in this artist rendition, it's it's lost a lot of all the schmoo that would be in there, even uh, more so, and packing everything in, but in an active way, in a in a suspensory way. So what happens, what can produce stiffness that we don't really want because stiffness, you know, alters where forces are going to go. And I, even in terms of this COVID thing, I had read an article that why the elderly tend to get, at least back, you know, a few weeks ago, that was a thinking, why they can tend to be more susceptible to um, COVID pneumonia is that they just have more stiffness in their lungs. And so stiffness is really not a good thing to have. Uh, why does it happen with aging, injury, disease, too much cross-linking between muscle fibers, um, neuromuscular dysfunction, cellular contractility through the my myofibroblast cells? Oh, and surgery. Oh, by the way, surgery. Um, decreased stiffness, corticosteroids. Yeah, and that can make you too weak, uh, but stretch-induced stretch tissue elongation. So again, things that we can use to reduce stiffness, things we can encourage our clients who can can do it in a safe and effective fashion to do at home. Think movements that we're going to ask the animal to do in our in our way that would be effective. So what are the consequences of fascial injury, sports or, or just activities of daily living? You can't do what you were gonna do. You might be in acute and chronic pain. You could get tie down of nerves, um, compression, vascular compromise, uh, when the vessels aren't transmitting oxygen and, and uh, relieving you know, the metabolic end products through the venous system, the tissue is not going to be healthy. So we can use the fascia once we continually recognize that we can use it as our big ally, um, knowing that it's going to be everywhere, knowing that we can do something one area and there could be consequences elsewhere. Um, and realizing that even though we're treating the hind limb, it's not just biomechanical compensatory patterns to the forelimb, it's that whole body and we have to look at the whole individual. And remember that, that various things that we're going to do, acupuncture, massage, even laser therapy and others are going to affect the fibroblasts and look at all these good things that they're putting out. These are the, the workhorse of the tissue and, and what they're putting out in terms of your structure and repair and enzymes and growth factors, we need to nurture them. And then realize too, when we're exercising one part of the body, it's affecting remote regions. We're seeing that uh, the research of that in the human field and then experimental animals to some extent. And that's why 
sometimes you can, or you get a massage somewhere and it's like, well, they didn't work on my neck, but my neck feels better now. So seeing, seeing all that continuity instead of seeing the separateness. And for those of you that have studied with me about the anti TPLO aspect of things that we should know what this is by now. This is the Pezian Serenus um, goose foot, which, which in the, in the un separated human, when you dissect them, has webbing between each of these three tendons here that come down to that medial tibiocondyle region, the sartorius, the gracilis, and the semitendinosus, all confluent there. And what's so meaningful there, aside from being a do not cut me zone, thank you very much, surgeon. But anyway, the beauty of the in situ intact region is that what it's such a high area of innervation and therefore proprioceptive impulses going back and forth. I mean, just sensory input, motor output, alterations from the brain signaling to the muscles when you tense up, when you don't. How do you protect that joint? Well, it requires the nervous system communicating with the muscles. When you cut that, you don't get that anymore, but who cares because your leg is fixed anyway because you had TPLO surgery. Anyways, hopefully that didn't happen, but um, here, if we look at this human and we have the sartorius insertion here, look at the length of that muscle and how the control of the knee then is connected to the front of the hip or in human, the anterior hip region. So the anterior pelvis or the front of the pelvis is coming down. Information between those two sites is impacting the knee and our brain should be getting signals from there. From the gracilis also coming down here to the knee, to the into that medial portion of the pelvis. So that's important, joint integrity between the pelvis and the lower limb. And then over here on the side, we have the semitendinosus all coming down here from the back of the pelvis. So we're having quite a bit of innate capacity to control our joints in space and to, to change our mechanics if the messages are sufficiently arriving to the spinal cord and brain from the nerves here and when they are not, that like Deanna had said, that we intervene early and um, and we can detect those strain patterns. We don't need to wait until they break down, but that means we're being proactive and palpating and spending time with our patients and individualizing their care. Um, here on the tensor fasciae lati, on the, the lateral aspect in that IT band, and look at all this dense fascia on the side here. And this is the outer aspect of the limb. So we have inner and outer. We need it all to be coordinated. and so. If somebody says that we have knee pain, it's like, okay, <laughs> you got a lot of things going on that might be referred from your hip. It, it's like there is no knee pain. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on there that is needing to be understood. Goes for any any pain anywhere, any problem. So, um, you know, essentially, just we need to have our patients not overdo it. We need to support them with physical medicine, uh, integrative rehab, and instead of anti-inflammatory drugs, which can be helpful for short term, in the long term, they can inhibit tissue regeneration and the endogenous resolution of inflammation. So what can we turn to? Medical acupuncture, photomedicine, medical massage, carefully selected botanicals, and movement therapy, rehab therapies. And so We've seen a lot of cables. What's the difference between the muscles that we've seen, the nerves that we've seen in this fiber optic cable? The difference is the elastic, um, being able to, to change it, change the physiology, have auto, I mean, there's a lot, everything's different, but th there's a structural similarity. But a similarity here, maybe who knows if the engineers knew anything about fascia, but look at all the protection that each of these fiber optic cables is getting. Um, just like we saw with the muscles, just like with the nerves, that each of these very delicate things has to be, you know, contained, but they're all grouped. And when they're grouped, they're, they're protected as well. Um, but it's the property of living tissue to be distorted and then to come back, viscoelastic properties that is so different and so gives us so many opportunities to intervene in a multimodal fashion and if we're not even recognizing these multi layers here, like think of blood vessels and, and all those things, several layers of protective, active reasons for being kind of areas. Um, and this is a cardiac muscle, you know, tissue represented, but, but 
so much similarity there, but so many opportunities for engagement that we're only on the brink of understanding in a way. And fortunately, we're, we're, we are where we are so that we can use all the fun modalities that we have and make a difference, which means you probably can't do that in your corporate high pressure practice where you have five minutes to see a patient. So you might need to make a change. But anyway, um, so in these cross sections from my book, um, my acupuncture book, Interactive Medical Acupuncture Anatomy, this is at the level of LI20. So right there is, is um, LI20. But but look, there's 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 no separation in the head. This is just a cross section right through that area. And um, here's the masseter muscle, big and thick. What's going on here versus there? Pterygoids, um, longus coli, your vessels, the back of your neck. So this is with the nose turning upward. There's your um, spinal cord or medulla probably by then the brain stem. And what's that collected in? So just like those fiber optic cables, collection, collection, protection but organization and separation. So these are facial muscles over here. This is the tongue, but these are neck muscles. And even there, there are the deeper neck muscles and the suboccipital rectus capitis posterior minor right there. And that actually is the, um, the interface between the myofascia and the dura right in this section. So that was, that was fortuitous that I chose that section. Down here, level of bladder 14. So, so right across the chest, here's the heart. Here's the lungs. You don't see any, I mean, there's spaces, maybe there in the trachea, there was air, but this is all fluid and active and conjoined and, um, but yet separated so that we have the truncal muscles and the, the intercostals and the back muscles, the erector spini versus the, the big movers, the pecs and the, the deltoids and the arm muscles. So just to, to reinforce that idea of, of things are collected and protected the, the kidneys here at the level um, kind of just after the ribs around uh, L1 here, L1, L2, but you know, the kidneys, the intestines, they're all packed in there. And so when we think back to that real obese body and how things distort and they get pushed around, I mean, there's gonna be compression of structures and tension where it shouldn't be and it's just generally unhealthful. So I hope that that has reinforced your enthusiasm and reason for doing what you're doing and to to be a better practitioner and a better diagnostician. So this a little saying I created, before we can treat, we must diagnose. Before we diagnose, we must feel. Before we feel, we must inquire. So talking to the client, understanding what's going on, who are they? As we inquire, we're observing. We're observing the individual and the family observing them moving, sitting, standing, um, their emotional aspect. As we observe, we note. We don't diagnose in one minute or in five minutes. We listen to the patient's story about their lives, their activities, their families, and their work, what they do day to day, their diets, their emotions, their pains, and their joys. In essence, be curious. Who is this being that has been entrusted to your care? So I hope that's been helpful. This is our integrative rehab course that's happening later this year. There are two parts. There's move ortho, which is more the somatic piece, musculoskeletal orthopedic, and then move neuro, which is uh, neurologic injuries and rehabilitation in the central peripheral autonomic perspective. And so they are together with both of those together. And then the internship, uh, that is our certification program. So thanks for being here. Appreciated your input and your attention, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.